Brownie, what he's what he's doing? Excuse me, as I burp in the microphone. Yeah, there. you did definitely. Yep. Um, you wanted football coverage? We're giving you football <laughs> coverage. Yeah. We swear and burp in the microphone over here. <laughs> All right, what's up, everybody? Yo, yo, yo! Oh my gosh, I'm choking on myself to start the podcast. How dare I? We're gonna roll with the punches. Sometimes you get sacked. You gotta battle back on second and fifteen. Okay? Gotta clear my throat. I'm okay. What's up? It's the NFL. It's week. It's still not <laughs> it's good. It's week fifteen in the books. Oh no! We're almost in the books, but uh, yes, I'm. <clears throat> I'm good now. Are Ahmed you though? Farid is here. I am gonna make it. Uh, Don't okay. worry. He is back from his vacation. Oh. Thank you. You look handsome, tan. Thank you. Wow. Well rested. Right. Great T-shirt you got on. Great T-shirt. Wow. Special T-shirt. Representing. Right. But we got it all today. We're ready to hit it all. I mean, we're even going to hit on that shit fest from Thursday night. The Chargers and the Raiders. Have to. Too much happened. Right. In the game and after the game. After the game. We got to at least give it a little there. Uh, Just for you know, for our weekly weird part of this, it's 10-7 Baltimore Ravens going into the fourth quarter. End of the third right now. Lamar just made an amazing scramble and threw a jump ball to Isaiah Likely. They are in scoring position. We'll see where it goes. Your voice could have some issues here. I don't know what's it. <laughs> it's not my be- voice. It's just it's probably uh, smoking too much weed the last few nights, and I've got a little phlegm in there or something. Do you Sorry. have water? Do we need do. to come get water for you? I'm okay, good. I'll make it. Um, no, it's are good. you gonna are we gonna be able to trust you on this? Are you no, gonna swear probably here? not. Okay, probably not. Um, <laughs> good to be back. The good. Dominican Republic was great. Great. First time you. I'd ever been there with the wife. Yeah. So got tan, and it was a little windy one of the days, and oh, it right. did rain. Right. How dare it? I mean, really, like, like I give a shit. We were stuck here in the Northeast. <laughs> off with your rain and a little windy in the Caribbean. Um, all right, uh, you and Connor, great on Wednesday. Went through all the offenses. I loved it. It's like Thanks. two big brain football uh, guys nice going toe to toe. When you're so, gone, you're a uh, nice guy. It, it's always, always, always the best when Connor comes on here, which he'll be doing probably more around draft season too. It's like he always knows all that stuff. But let's not get ahead of ourselves. We got games to talk about. Games. So. Our promise to you, the homie, each and every Sunday is that we will talk about all the games, and that includes the games on Saturday, too. We're not going to dismiss those games. Well, of we, course we're not, especially when the Detroit Lions exactly. are one of those teams playing, and they won, and they exactly. looked as good as they have in the last month. we got, we got to hit on that. We oh, knew that was going to be a centerpiece for your conversation and here. Pete, Pete asked me before the pod, he's like, should we just keep them at the end? I was like, no, bring them up. Bring them <laughs> higher in the show. So they will be higher in the show. But here are the categories that go far from dead. we got teams and cruise control. we got give me the headlines, of course. We've got the wild card hopefuls. We will take a look back at Thursday night as we said and Monday night football preview we got a first tweet from 49ers 701 that says damn okay Chris Sims and the crew for staying late after hours just for us damn we appreciate that at 49ers 701 that's nice of you thinking of us and yes it is uh it, the the whole crew is awesome, especially the people behind the scenes, because they got to stay here even later than we do, I know. and figure out how to publish it and cut it up a little bit, and all this stuff I don't know about here. But we have fun doing it. I feel like we're in a groove. It only took us fourteen or fifteen weeks, but we're in a groove now. <laughs> Pete's back there. He's the one that has to stay uh, stay late with Gabby and Morgan, and uh, we do appreciate it all. Appreciate the homies. Uh, with the uh, early commutes on Monday, getting to listen to this. All right, I'll start with Far From Dead. We just got one game here yeah. because it is maybe one of the strangest, if not the strangest team in the NFL this yeah, year. That's right. That I'm talking about the Buffalo Bills. Right. They destroy, destroy the Dallas Cowboys. 31-10 to 10 is the final score. And so this is I, – I think we should start with the Bills here, but there's something for both of these teams. You mentioned it yep. on Football Night in America. The Cowboys losing by double digits here. Yeah. You don't see a whole lot of teams that end yeah. up going to or winning a Super Bowl. Right. That lose a game like this. That's right. In that's, December. Yeah, yeah. And on the other side, yeah. the Buffalo Bills now, right. this is their fifth win this season by right. 20 or more points. It's impressive. Which ties a franchise record. So that would indicate that they have a pretty good chance to make a deep run if they've got it all together right now. So let's start with the Bills side. Okay. Of it. All right. And but I like, first off, just, I do oh. like, I mean, the, the part that you said about the Cowboys, though. Okay. Hold on. Okay, let's fine. start with the Cowboys. Let's all start right. with the Cowboys. I just was going to bounce it. off that either, <laughs> either way. Yeah. But, uh, no, I mean, listen, you know me. I love football. I've been watching them. My whole life, like I was sitting there watching it going, you know, like I kind of viewed, especially after last week, the way the Cowboys have played over the last two months and gone, you know, I, I think they're a Super Bowl team. But as I'm seeing the game melt away from them and be dominated, right, I'm sitting there going, man, I mean, really, I go, I said it out loud in the viewing room. I said, I don't know any Super Bowl teams that lose like this in the middle of December. Like, I just, I can't think of one. 
right? And then, of course, we got all the people in the back who are like, what, you, you want me to look it up? You want me to look it up? How far do you want me to go back? And I'm like, I, I don't know. You don't have to go back at all. They go, how about I just look at the ten, last 10 years? And I was like, yeah, sure, whatever you want. And they were all excited. Yeah. James Kaminsky, Kaminsky is the one who did it. And he, like, go, he looks it up. He comes back to me with a no card like five minutes later. He's like, no, no, dude, he's like, you're, you're right. You're right. He's like, in fact, no, but no Super Bowl team in the last 10 years has even lost by double-digit points in December, right? So this is the time of the year where you're supposed to be rounded into shape, and even when you don't play your best, you lose a close one, right? So that is a little alarming to me. That shows real flaws in Dallas, you know? And I know there was an injury here or there on the offensive line, Zach Martin, defensive line, no Jonathan Haggins. But still, I think there's something bigger there when you, when you lose that mm. type of a football game that way. All right, more to dive into yeah, with sorry. the, the I just Dallas want to hit on that No, main comment. It's your podcast. You can do okay. whatever you want. Um, but yeah, let's let's talk. Let's give the Bills a props yeah, because they did some some things in this game that I don't know that we thought they could do. One of them with the injuries they've had on defense and mm-hmm. the way they've looked on defense, That's holding right. the Cowboys to ten points. That's right. And James Cook in the running game going off yes. 179 yards for James Cook. They fed him. Joe Brady is. He's, he's, they found something here, they did. it seems like. Yeah. 25 rushes, uh, both career highs for James Cook there in the rushes and the yards. I mean, what you, what'd you make of offensively and defensively for the Buffalo Bills? Well, I mean, uh, found, they found physicality on the offensive side of the ball that I just didn't know or didn't think you could really like recapture this late in the year or even capture at all because I would say they didn't have it through the first you know maybe nine weeks of the season, ten weeks of the season at least. right? So that's what Joe Brady has brought to the table there. Now, yeah, it's the running the game, the physicality there, and then added on top of that, just James Cook in the pass game. That's been a huge weapon as well. My big thing is, is I think this is the first game in the McDermott, Sean Allen, I mean, Sean McDermott, Josh Allen era, that I look at it and go, they won a big game, and it wasn't because of Josh Allen. He didn't have to carry the team. And these are the things where, you know me, I've, I've been, I love the Bills and love Josh Allen, but I'm also like, oh, I wish they would change the way they play. They can't win a Super Bowl or go to the Super Bowl with this going, hey, Josh, carry us all the time, right? right? That, that's my complaint. And, then, you know, remember I was making some jokes a few weeks ago after the Eagles game. Like, I checked the rule book. A defensive player is allowed to make a play. Somebody else on the offense can do something besides Josh Allen, right? And I think we're seeing that a little bit. I mean, really, what would we be viewing the Buffalo Bills like if they had beat Philadelphia that night? We'd go, they won four in a row. They're kicking ass. They're playing high-level football. They're definitely playing some of the best high-level football in the AFC right now. So they're dangerous. And what they did to Dallas today, I mean, it was an ass-whooping from the start. It was one of those where the game started and you went, man, Buffalo's coming out pissed off and hitting. And Dallas felt like they were like, oh, let's feel this out a little bit. How are they going to play us? And it just never stopped that way. And I just don't ever remember. I mean, in the third quarter at one point, I was joking. I was literally going, wait, if you told me in the third quarter that Josh Allen had 70 yards passing, I was go, Dallas must be winning 30-3. to Like, there's no way that this game is going. And instead, it was 31-3 to the other way because of all the things you've talked about. So kudos to Joe Brady and Sean McDermott for figuring things out there. And then to your point, what they're doing on the defensive side of the ball, one of the hottest offenses in the sport, right, to, to kind of stymie the Cowboys, pressure Dak Prescott the way he did today when he didn't have pressure. It looked like he could not find people open. As I started to watch the game, right, here's the thing that I started to go, uh, like I went one, no Jonathan Hankins. They're not a very big physical run-stopping defense to begin with, right? So that – and, I, whoa, they're running the ball. So that that scared me a little bit. Then on the other side of the ball, what I saw and I, what I went, man, I wish I would have kind of said this last week. As good as Dallas has been, you know I call their attack, like, simple. It's simple. It's been aggressive, and they have good players – Right, But I don't sit there and watch the plays like I've talked to you about or on Sunday Night Football last week and go, oh, wow, these are so cool. I just go, this is a good, basic, aggressive play, right? That's the kind of stuff McDermott can game, like, you know, get into the whole thing again where, hey, we're showing a blitz here, but we dropped out and we got underneath all your routes and everywhere you wanted to throw the ball, we had people. Because I think there is a little bit of that basicness to that Cowboys offense. Mm. And that's where McDermott can be special that way. When he starts to get a feel for you, plus he's not like too worried about your run game, going, eh, they're a pass-first team right now. They want to throw the ball. I'm going to err on us playing pass defense. That's when they're at their best. But the energy and the physicality, what I've seen from the Bills over the last month, I think that is the big thing right now. And, 
yeah, off of this win, even though they're no shooing for the playoffs as we sit here right now, I sit here and go, there's not many teams, if any, in the AFC playing better than the Buffalo Bills right now. I mean, no, Baltimore's not playing their best. We know Miami just lost last Monday night, right? So uh, it's going to be interesting to see how all this plays out. And hopefully, you know, they didn't dig themselves in too big of a hole here where they miss out on the playoffs. Right, yeah. At this moment, they sit at 8-6. and six. They're but the they ninth seed. Out of the playoffs, yeah. Right. They're the ninth seed right now. But Indianapolis is in at 8-6. and six. Cincinnati's in at 8-6. and six. And so I, there's still a lot to be determined. Yeah, there's a lot of football left. Jacksonville playing right now. If they lose, they're 8-6. and six. Of course, different division. Could still win the division there. Uh, we got a couple other tweets on James Cook. Joshua says, damn okay. James Cook, second in the NFL in rushing and behind only McCaffrey and Tyreek Hill in scrimmage right? yards. I did not know that. No, it's shocking. I mean, it, it is shocking. You know, it's one because they're not a real running football team, right? It's a year where there's not a lot of big-time rushing attacks, right? Raheem Mostert, like we know, the first thing they want to do is throw the ball to Tyree Kill, right? Then they go, oh, wait, you're playing so deep to stop Tyree Kill. Okay, we'll run the ball, right? I mean, so that's what that is a little bit. You've had some injuries on the at the running back position. There's been no go-to guy other than McCaffrey. And James Cook quietly has, like, even in games where they go, oh, well, they didn't run the ball that much. It was like 10 for 70, right? He's had a lot of games like that. Mm -hmm. And uh, here they are now making the run game more of a real part of the offense, and it's starting to become real with what they do. And what do you think of James Cook as a talent? Because I saw that first touchdown he caught. Right. I was like, dang, he's that's great a at good that catch. Stuff, it was like right? below his waist. Yeah. It was not really an easy catch for even a wide receiver. Here we got a running back. And then he did drop one. A little bit later in the yeah, game, yeah, I was like, well, right. can I compliment right. his hands now right. on the pod? I was like, as I still will. Um, but, yeah, what do you think of him as a talent? Because it seemed like a lot was expected of him in the beginning, a little bit of a slow start. Maybe they didn't know how to utilize him. He does seem like a little bit different of a player now. Uh, yeah, definitely. Um, he's, I think, just confidence and, like, knowing just – what do I want to say? Just aggressiveness with the ball in his hand. I think that's what I want to – like, no nonsense. You see the hole, go through it 1,000 miles per hour. This isn't college football where it's like, ooh, I'm not sure about that hole. I'm fast enough to still, if I miss it, bounce down on the outside. There's more decisiveness to his game. I guess that's what I'm saying. Yeah. The past game, I s always saw some of the things you talk about. You know, when he came in the NFL, I was just like, yeah, he's going to be awesome on third downs and doing all that and catching the ball out of the backfield, right? But they've expanded that role for him. He caught the seam pass last week, right, against the Chiefs early on for a mm -hmm. touchdown and doing that. But to me, is a little bit more of the angry running, right? You know, I think that's what's changed a little bit where, you know, no dancing, get in the hole, the vision, the right cuts that way. And then, you know, putting the putting his head down and, OK, nothing's here. You know, I ran for 10 already. Let me put my head down and drive for four or five more. I think that's what I see more than anything. And then on top of that, like we always talk about, you got to have that attitude as a football team. And Joe Brady basically said, F this Josh Allen throw the ball every play thing. O-line, we're going to toughen up. We're going to add a little attitude to the team here, and, and James Cook has responded the right way. It was like, you got the last guy fired. We threw so much, you got him fired. <laughs> They're like, well, but the guy before that got a head coaching job, so yeah, <laughs> That's don't, right. don't worry about it. Uh, as for Dallas right now, here's the good news. They clinched a playoff berth for the third straight season after Atlanta lost today. Uh, the bad news is that they're now the five seed as they sit right now. Ten yeah. wins, though. But after the win against the Eagles last week, you're thinking, oh, division. And maybe if the 49ers slip up, who knows? You still could have a chance at the one seed. No, sure. I don't see that happening, but we'll see. I don't see one seed happening, but I'm saying coming into this week. Oh yeah, you you, start oh, yeah to you're see right. It. Oh, you're right. Sorry, right. sorry, sorry. Yes. But but now it's like the, now the Eagles jump back into the driver's seat for the division. And right. The Eagles already had the inside track, right? I mean, if they won out, yes, they won the division true. no matter what. That's right? true. But so, the way they're playing, you don't know. Oh no, you're 100 percent right. I mean, to think that they're just going to automatically win next week up in. Uh, in C or tomorrow night in Seattle, no chance. And perhaps no chance. even more importantly for Dallas yeah. is that it's looking like they're going to have to play on the road and away from home. And they they're are not clearly the same, right? they're clearly a different team at home versus on the road. It's incredible. I mean, it's just rare to see a high quality team be that different in you know different of a team and how they look compared to where they play. Uh, I didn't think it would be that big of an adjustment. Again, Buffalo's field turf, right? So you're like, oh, okay. Yeah. You know, they're still going to be fast. I didn't look at it to go, oh, wow. And, you know, hey, okay, it's a little cold, but it's the Cowboys. They play in the NFC East. They're, they shouldn't be like, oh, no, it's cold, right? I mean, they go up to New York and Philadelphia every year. Shouldn't be too big of an adjustment. The big thing, I think, again, we've gotten into this. 
the size of their defense is an issue. When Buffalo, they get ahead of the chains, when anybody gets ahead of the chains and it becomes second and three and second and four, which Buffalo did a really good job today, Dallas, that takes away Dallas. Oh, the crazy pass rush, the stunts, the blitz, right? Because they go, well, it's second and four. They can still run the ball. So I don't want to do anything crazy up front because they could gash us and then all of a sudden we're, we're screwed. So that chops, you know, one of their legs out from underneath them a little bit. That was kudos to Buffalo. And then, you know, Dallas, when they're behind, when they get behind a little bit and now a team can go, no, we're not going to pass the ball. You're not going to get strip sacks and, you know, and we're not going to throw interceptions and we're going to get hit as we're throwing and all that. That takes another huge avenue away from the Dallas Cowboys. So altogether, you know, Dallas is going to get roasted tomorrow. We know that. You know, it looked like, okay, hey, we're finally sitting there. Dallas is real for the first time ever, right? And I think there was other people that, you know, that weren't like me. They were going, no, nah, this is Dallas. They won a big game. They'll fall apart this week. You watch. This is what Dallas does. And that's what they're going to have to hear from a bunch of people tomorrow. You know, yes, the moment we thought they were here, they go up to Buffalo and just get their ass whooped. I mean, physically whooped. And uh, like I said, I just don't see Super Bowl teams do that yeah. in, the, in the middle of December. Here's the only good news for the Dallas Cowboys. Yeah. It was always going to be what they did in the playoffs. And yeah. so almost all this stuff is irrelevant. Right. Like pl not playing at home is relevant for right. them, it seems like. But uh, it still is all going to be That's where it all comes down to. It's all going to be decided in the playoffs. You're right. They just want it on their field. Yes. At least one game, yep. if not all of them. For sure. Uh, yeah. I think the 49ers are going to have a whole lot of home playoff games. Uh, we go to the cruise control section right now. And there is no team in the NFL that is more on cruise control than the San Francisco. Francisco 49ers they cruise to 45 points beating the Arizona Cardinals 45 to 29 they have clinched the NFC West for the second straight season consecutive division titles for the first time since 2011 and 2012 uh, and they have won now six straight games by double digits for the first time since 1993 yeah they are rolling at a pace that even those good 49er teams were not rolling like. no this is I don't remember I mean, damn, I, I, you know, I, I grew up watching the 49ers and rooting against them and watching Joe Montana beat my dad in regular season games and all that shit. So I don't remember them just, like, physically dominating teams like this or, like – I mean, is every touchdown a highlight play? I mean, right? I mean, every I mean, every drive they go on, you go, well, there's three or four highlights right there. Like, I mean, it's just – it's not like it's like, oh, run for four, run for five. run. It's like run for 12, reverse for 18. Oh, Kittle down the middle for 40. I mean, it's unbelievable what they're doing right now. They took over the overall Nets point lead today in the NFL to show that overall dominance, right, too. I, that was one thing that, you know, it does one of the numbers out there that kind of – shows you who are the most best teams in football, most dominant, whatever. Um, you know, Cardinals tried to make some plays and hang in there, and they, you know. Ran for 234 ran the ball, yards. Right? I know. Ran the ball. Trey McBride early on in the game, the tight end, he was a big target for Kyler Murray. You know, they were doing some good things early on in the football game. Uh, but they just can't – you can't keep pace. You can't keep pace with the 49ers. That, that's the big thing. And, you know, to keep pace with them, you got to score touchdowns, too. They don't settle for many field goals there in San Francisco. Uh, defense, running the ball. I mean, the 49ers, you know, the Cardinals running the ball. I'm not shocked by that. There was no, no Armstead and no Hargrave today. They had to start two backups at the defensive tackle position. So that wasn't shocking from that standpoint. You know, offensively, I, I don't know. I don't know. I mean, we haven't seen an offense function at this high of a level, I think, in the run game and pass game both. I know the Dolphins were doing some of that early on in the year. I think this has a little bit of a different look, like a physical inevitable will to them where it's like it doesn't matter what defense you play. You go, it seems like they can run up the middle for 10 on anybody, and they can throw it for 15 or 20 on anybody right now. Um, clearly the best team in football, the way they're playing. And to the point of, hey, we were talking about Super Bowl and all that, this is how usually Super Bowl teams look. November, it's going upwards. December, it starts to go steep, more even steep upwards. And right now, yeah, they look like they're they're becoming a better team as we go late into the season here and, and really starting to hit their stride. Not Bucky Cox says, damn okay, Kyle. 49ers averaging 34.5 points per game the last six games. He's clearly the best play caller in the league, plus yes. the defense is rounding into form. It's time for the coach of the year narrative to change from coach who made the playoffs with a meh team yeah. to just yeah. the best coach. That's right. We've been talking about that, right? I, and, I, you know, there's no disrespect to any of the great coaches out there. Like, you know, your coach for the 
Lions. I know you're all sad and you want to make sure you he he literally read that and was like sad. He's like, Well, what about my Dan Campbell? <laughs> I, that's what I know. That's I know, what yes, I am what you sad. were thinking. No. And they're deserving. I think the the thing that, you know, uh, our our not Bucky Cox is saying, and this is what I've been trying to say too, I just I think He's clearly the best coach in the NFL right now, the head, best head coach in the NFL. I don't think it's close. And, like, as an offensive play caller, I, I think it's by far number one. Like, yes. So, you know, and I know I'm a little biased too, but I also know I'm not that biased because you heard me in other years where they were really good and did some things, and I didn't say, oh, Shanahan should be the coach of the year or any of that. I just what they're doing, their team, the way they're kicking ass, it is a quarterback that still was Mr. Irrelevant, and it's just his first year as a full starter, and here they are with a grasp to, to win the number one seed in the NFC. You know who's not biased? Who's that? Our friend Jay Croucher. Yeah. He's Australian. Right. He doesn't know Kyle Shanahan from the next guy. Actually, he does know who he is. Uh, but he's been banging the drum for Kyle Shanahan. Wow, has he? That's cool to yeah, hear. Yeah, he, he tweeted this out. He goes, a couple of misnomers about Coach of the Year is that you have to make a massive wins leap. He right. goes, Mike Vrabel and Bruce Arians both uh, won improving by just one win. He goes, <laughs> also, you, you can't have a superstar team. He says, well, four of the past eight winners have been one seeds, and that doesn't include Belichick's three Coach of the Year wins with Tom Brady. And I do think it's like the 49ers, people make the arguments all around with the 49ers. It's like, well, you – you can't give Brock Purdy the MVP because he's got Kyle Shanahan. And it's like, well, you can't give Kyle Shanahan Coach of the Year because he's got Brock Purdy and right. Christian McCaffrey yeah. and Debo, Debo Samuel. Samuel and all these it's guys, like, well, right. you, you can't give – it's like give Executive of the Year <laughs> then to, to John Lynch, I guess, is well, all you can do. Well, that's what he is, though. He is final say right. on the roster, right. Shanahan. So, yeah, that's where I also – you know, to your point of like, hey, Dan Campbell – does all these things and change the culture around for the Lions, right? We're almost talking about last year a little bit. Oh, for sure. That's where I want to say that with Shanahan, too. Like, all these guys that came out of nowhere and their mid-round picks, I mean, he picked them. He has total control in San Francisco. John Lynch is the GM. He supplies Kyle with the information. They talk about it. Kyle makes the decision. It's a great combination they got working right now. And we'll see, you know, but, but yeah, I, you know, again, I know this is a year where there's a lot out there right now, but the way, Hey, the dolphins aren't killing it on offense. Like four weeks ago, I said, McDaniel was the guy, the guy I would go coach of the year. They were revolutionizing offense. It slowed down a little bit, you know, on that side of the ball, they lost the game last week. The 49ers, just everything is hitting on in, in all cylinders, and that, that's what's amazing. Brock Purdy did get hit, came out of the game for a couple of yeah, plays. That's and right. I, I remember thinking when I was watching that, and Sam Darnold came in. Yeah. And I was like, man, I, I bet they could be fine with Sam Darnold. I bet they'd be okay. I, I, I don't think – I don't know. think they'd be as good. Yeah. I think Brock is – better and functions yeah. better in this offense yeah. i don't know yeah. if you have a different no, no, opinion, no. I, I do I, I i think brock has got a natural sense and feel for the game that i definitely have not seen from sam darnold sam darnold has some physical ability that's every bit as good as brock purdy that's what i would say but yeah i don't think it would function at the same level but still be like oh wow damn they're still good with sam darnold i, I don't doubt that and that's not a slap at brock purdy again i want to remind people when i say shit like that sometimes my dad was phil sims who Jeff Hostetler came in and won the Super Bowl without Phil Simms there. It's a f team sport. Like, everybody's got to, like, chill out when you, you say stuff like that sometimes. You know, there's more to it, and I'm not trying to downplay Brock Purdy because of that. Yeah. Right. yeah I always thought Jeff Hostetler was underrated, maybe a better quarterback in person. <laughs> Get my podcast. <laughs> uh, so the Brock Purdy MVP talk will be accelerated this week all around NFL media. I'll tell you one case that took a hit. The guy, your guy, oh, took a hit he today. Did take a, he took a hit today. Tyreek Hill yes. did not play right. for the Dolphins, right. going against a very tough New York Jets defense, right. and it didn't matter. Yes. 30 to nothing. <laughs> that screwed your case all up. Uh, it, messed, it messed it up. Huh? Well, it, it, by appearances, it does. Their yeah. offense wasn't all that crazy good today. Oh. It was 224 yards passing, and then, you know they had their way, but... Their defense dominated the day. That was the big thing. I mean, the Jets at one point were like negative yards. They could do nothing. I mean, again, the first touchdown drive was a three-play, one-yard touchdown drive. Three plays to get one yard, all right? You know, the next time down, which was also good field position, was a nine-play, 22-yard drive for a field goal, okay? Then they hit Jalen Waddell on the go route up the sidelines for a touchdown, right? Then their first real drive of the game was the – uh, the the one that you know I don't they, it, once it was over when it was seven nothing but when they went up twenty four to nothing that was like dagger done see you later eleven plays right? eighty yards it on was that more one. work for them today 
you know, that's the big thing. They're still really good. I know. I joke. I still think Tyreek Hill is probably the MVP. I'm not going to take that away, but he can't miss any more football games, and he better come back in a big way. But that's what he does is, you know, he takes pressure off them. He opens up the field, let alone, like we always talk about, he catches a reverse, a slant, a, you know, a go route or whatever, and it just, oh, there's 40 yards, and no, now the rest of the drive's kind of easy, right? That's, that's what he provides for you. They're still really good on offense without Tyreek Hill. The Jets, disaster, yep. disaster. And the really, I, Zach Wilson, he, he got banged up. He got crushed, right, on the strip sack fumble. Concussion. And that led to that three-play, one-yard yeah. touchdown drive. The, the play of the game and the moment of the game was Robert Sala calling the fake punt. It was 7 nothing, right? And you got a really good defense. They were around the 30-yard line, 35-yard line. It was like fourth and five or six. It was around that range. It was a long way. It was, yeah. And the Dolphins had their defense in, and they still called the fake punt. Like, that to me was the dumbest part of the football game. The Dolphins are in a game right there where they just took them three plays to get one yard for the touchdown. They're doubting whether they're that good without Tyree Kill. Punt the fall ball, punt the ball down in there, and make them doubt themselves and see if they can drive the field on your defense. Instead, you give them the ball right here and go, hey, hey. Here you go. You're up 10 nothing. You feel better? Did you get a little more confidence without Tyreek? Right? I mean, that to me was the biggest no-no of the day. And, uh, yeah, the game was over after that point. Basically. I mean, maybe Robert Sala thought that was the best chance they had to get yards well, in, I, in the first I, half. They're I, like, I think our punt team might be better than our offense well, right now. Well, the, the, to this point, too, I mean, I, I understand <laughs> what you're knows? saying. I understand what yeah. you're saying. Zach Wilson did not look horrible at that point. Zach Wilson actually made a few good throws, and they had a drop where you were just going, wait, this – they're not, like, overwhelmed. He's not horrible looking. They're okay. He's building on what he did last week. But that squashed that building, and, and uh, yeah, Miami just kind of slow death the Jets, and that one was all she wrote. Mike McDaniel, uh, after the game, was uh, glowing about his team coming back from that devastating collapse on, on Monday night. He goes, I'm very proud, as proud as I've been, of any performance since I have been here. Um, so, so he was pumped about it. And so uh, let's go inside the numbers yeah. powered by AWS here. We talked about a little bit, no Tyreek Hill. So Jalen Waddle had to take over and that he did targeted nine times, caught eight of them, 142 yards. That was a season high in receiving yards. Yep. And it was plus 66 over expected and his yards after catch over expected were plus 30. He was targeted on all four of his routes when used in a shift or motion for a season high 39 yards. What yeah. is that stat telling well, us? Well, it just tells you he took over the role of Tyreek Hill ah, a little bit, right? You know, Tyreek's usually the shift, the motion guy. Oh, no, they can't handle your speed off the shifter motion. And they're talking about, wait, we're in this coverage now as you're flying into motion. And guys are like, what? What coverage are you in? They're like, oh, it's too late. He already caught it. He's down the field, right? So that's what he do that's what they do to you. It was a good, efficient day. you know. And, and Waddle, yeah, it was um, – some good game plan design plays where there was a long throw down the sideline for the touchdown, a few little like crossers or corner routes to kind of expose the Jets coverage. But the Dolphins played the game the right way. Like you, like you always hear me say, right? Like know who you're playing and do it the right way. They were kind of conservative. Tua was really just like, hey, I'm going to work the middle of the field, intermediate throws. They didn't try to, they didn't let the Jets defense win the game, right? And they knew their defense was going to give the Jets offense a hard time. So I think they kind of played it close to the vest anyways. And uh, yeah, their D whooped ass, right? The, their D, I like a lot of their D. I know everyone's going to go, damn, they let up two touchdowns late in the game last week. But as I told you last week, like they kind of got into, we're up 28-13, we're going to prevent, we're not going to let up the big play, and kind of got out of their rhythm and the normal flow of what they had been in. Mm. Well, you saw today, I mean, the Jets were embarrassing up front with how they blocked for the quarterback once again. And that's just, I, I just can't even get over that some weeks watching them. Pete notes here on the Wednesday pod that you pointed out that the Titans used a very aggressive, exotic look to cover the Dolphins. Yes. Uh, the Jets. No. Did not. This is this is to me, the Jets defense as good as it is, right? This is why to me the Jets can't carry the football team like the Browns defense can. The the Jets run Seattle three. And within Seattle three, there's like three defenses they run, right? So they're really good at it, but it doesn't necessarily mean they're gonna squash people sometimes, make plays, right? They just kind of were like Bend. We bend a little. We bend a little. We bend a little. Oh, but we got talent. Oh, we bent a little. Oh, but you made a mistake, and now we got an interception, or we got a sack, right? 
Like, if you watch them, the Jets, they line up in the same three defenses all game. We watch the Cleveland Browns together. You'd be me and you'd be like, I'd be like, you'd be like, Chris, what defense would be? Like? I'd be like, I have no clue. This is crazy. There's nine guys at the line of scrimmage. Four are gonna drop out. Three are gonna blitz. I don't know what they're doing, right? So that's where, as talented as the Jets' defense is, the scheme is not one even like the 2000 Ravens or the 85 Bears, that's going to allow it to take over games and carry a football mm -hmm. team sometimes, yeah. right? Where Schwartz is, I'm going to blitz this, I'm going to do this, I'm going to, you know, line up like this, and maybe we'll cause some turnovers or, you know, a lot of negative plays, and we'll just play that way. And then our offense will get the ball at the 50-yard line or we'll get a turnover and they'll have it at the 20-yard line going in. And there's a difference there in that style approach. Jets defense really good, but – yeah, not going to do things that are exotic yeah. like Mike Vrabel did to stop them the week before. So now for the 13th straight season, the Jets will not be a playoff team. It's the longest active streak in the four major American sports. Eighth straight losing season. Damn. And I think it's almost certain now, in my mind at least. You hear that, Matt Casey? Longest <laughs> playoff drought in Why the professional Matt, sports. He, he should have walked away. He said he's very he should, aware. He should, he's very aware. He is very aware of that. Um, but I think it's very, at least in my mind, it's very apparent that Aaron Rodgers would not have saved this team because I don't think they could have protected him. No, I, I, I'm, I'm with you too. Now, are they six and eight maybe instead of five and nine? Okay, yeah, sure. But yeah, I know for all those that out there think that like they would be uh, leading the AFC East or like a number one or two seed, there's absolutely no way. There's no way. Not with this group out here, right? Like again, Zach Wilson's way more mobile than Aaron Rodgers. He can't get out of some of this stuff, right? That's, now, I know Rodgers could probably get the ball out of his hands quicker and has a little bit of feel that way. But, yeah, I don't think it would have been that drastic of a different of football team altogether if Aaron Rodgers is the starting quarterback. I don't think it would be crazy, no. All right, Matt Casey is saying to move on to the next game, which we will do. The Chiefs defeat the Patriots. 27-17 was the final score. They can clinch the AFC West with a win versus the Raiders next week. Um, Patrick Mahomes, a couple touchdowns, did have a couple interceptions in this game. Yeah. What was what was your making? There were times where I was like, "All right, this is the this is the old Chiefs." Right, they have moments of it. They do. You're right, but you said moments there. Well, it's because there's still these moments that we see all year where it's it's mistakes, it's missed field goal, it's drops again. Right, you know, he throws an interception down the middle to Blake Bell. It's a tight throw. You'd go, ah, I'd rather you don't throw that, Patrick. But Blake Bell, you're a lot, you're not stuck in cement. Like, take a step back and come to the ball. He just sat there and was like, wait, my arms won't go out there any farther. No, they're stuck to your body. They don't go out any farther, right? So come to the ball. You know, there's just stupid stuff they do. Kadarius Tony slant over the middle, plays volleyball with himself as he's running down the field. And he's like, here you go, Patriot player, right? Two, you know? two Mahomes interceptions this year. One was the pick six to Brian Branch the first game of the yeah, year. Yeah, that's right. Have been off of Tony's hands, perfectly yeah. thrown balls and yeah, intercepted. exactly. You know, Kelsey drops a touchdown pass. You know, kind of alligator arms it, yeah. felt the safety that coming. Was gonna be, I think he was trying to get it down into his body as I, quick I think as so possible. Too, trying to get it, get in the position to kind of take, absorb the blow, yeah. right? And, and within that, just drop the ball. Uh, but but I, I hear your point in what you're saying. You know, there were moments in the game where you went, oh man, they're you know they're moving the ball here. They look efficient. Again, there's there's it's the Chiefs were spoiled by how great they've looked in the past, and I think we all got to remind ourselves, like, hey, but still a top five defense in football, and they're still a top ten offense in football. And we've been so spoiled by their sexiness and their inevitable, like, they're going to go down the field here and score. He's going to make a few plays that I think when it doesn't happen, we're still a little bit in shock overall. Yeah. Uh, Patriots made life tough a little bit. They did. Um, I, you know, the, the big thing is, is just the Patriots offense, the stupid mistakes they make, the bad interception by Zappy. That was a horrible one. Uh, and another mistake that I'm yeah. missing. Maybe a missed throw or two that I'm missing. But overall, just not on the same – talent level playing field as the Chiefs as a, as a complete football team. Rasheed Rice now does have seven touchdown receptions this year. It sets a Kansas City Chiefs rookie record, so that is a positive. And also a positive was Clyde edwards Elaire or Hilaire. Hilaire. I always forget Hilaire. if it's Hilaire. Yeah, it's Hilaire. Hilaire. Is it yeah. silent H? I, I, I think it is a little bit, yes. Eclair. Yeah. Uh, 13 rushes, 37 yards, but he did catch four balls for 62 yards and a touchdown. Outsider says Damo Clay, uh, Damo K, Clyde Edwards Hilaire. <laughs> Guy has been on the outs with the fans, but has answered the call while Isaiah Pacheco heals up. Yeah, well, the, the first touchdown they scored was from the big screen from Clyde Edwards Hilaire, right? You know, of course, he had the touchdown when Mahomes kind of scrambles and finds him in the end zone. So it's good. It's good to see, 
right? A guy that, yeah, he's a first round pick. He hasn't lived up to the billing. He's been solid. He's been good, right? You know, but without Isaiah Pacheco, they got to ride him a little hard, a little harder. And that was good to see him kind of answer the bell there. You know, you talked about Rasheed Rice. Again, he looks like the guy that could be something here. They're going to continue to let Kadarius Tony have touches because they have nobody on the team that's like him. So even though he messes up two or three times every game, they're not going to let it die. They traded around. They traded what a third round pick for him, right? They think he's a first round talent, all right? And you know they they think he could be a guy that can provide those special plays that you need to make in the playoffs or the Super Bowl, which he did for them returning the punt last year to help them beat the Eagles in the Super Bowl. But yeah. yeah, overall, you know. It, the offense, as much as it's still a work in progress, it's still going to be scary when you got to see Patrick Mahomes and Andy Reid coming to town or you got to go to Kansas City and play that group in the playoffs. Defense, still phenomenal. Aggressive, creative. You know, even after the Mahomes first interception, you're going, oh, damn, here's, they're going to have the ball. They're, damn, are the Patriots going to go up 14 7? Chiefs defense shuts them down, su- su- makes them settle for a field goal 10 7, right? Uh, not enough weapons on that that Patriots offense to really attack a Chiefs defense. 11 losses now for the Patriots, ties the most losses in a season under Bill Belichick, and we will not talk about the Patriots until draft season or when they make a decision with their head coach. So that's it for the well, Patriots. Well, we're going to talk about them next week and right, the week fine. after that. All right, but All yeah. Right, uh, Requiem for a team, too. Requiem for a team. That. Ooh, wow, that's yeah, crazy. You, I mean, you haven't had one this early. You better come strong I with this one. i got a lot one. of poems i got to catch you up will. on here. Uh, we will be talking about the Detroit Lions every pod, maybe multiple times a pod, because they had the best game in a long time. I think maybe since the Monday night game against the Raiders, like the most complete game. And yeah. This might have been their best win of the season, too, against a hot Denver Broncos team. They just destroyed them, even messing up. Some of the drives early in the game, 42-17, the final score. They can clinch a playoff berth with a Seattle loss tomorrow. It's going to happen at some point. Um, but, man, oh, man, uh, just just talk glowingly about my Detroit Lions well, for when they play 20, with to, that 20 ty- to 35 minutes. When they play that type of balance, right, I, I just they're, – they're, they're impossible. Is another one where I kind of told you a little bit about the McDermott and the simple pass of the Cowboys game – where, yeah, we've all admired what the the Broncos have done on defense, right? It's amazing. But as I sat there and the game started early and it looked easy for, like, you know, you hit to that point where the first touchdown drive and then you're watching them the second drive and you're going, damn, it's, like, starting to look easy, right? It's like, it's like they're playing against the second team, their second team defense in practice out here. I, I started to go, you know, the, the Broncos, even though through this win streak and all that, have not had to play a team with this type of balance on offense where they had to go, whoa, we got to put one more egg in the stop the run game, and oh, shit, we got to actually put another one more egg in the stop the play action pass game off of that. We don't have enough eggs to go around, right? And I think you look through their winning streak a little bit, you'd go, the teams they played are kind of one-dimensional a little. Got to play the Chiefs. Right, I know they're a little bit better, but still, it was still about stop Patrick Mahomes. I know Pacheco can run the ball and do all that. But my point being is that, yeah, this was one where it just was too much for Vance Joseph and the defense. The, the Broncos are not big up front. Defense r- stopping the run is an issue for them. And if you're too good at passing the ball, they can't go in on stopping the run game. So that's kind of when I, I the second touchdown drive, I was like. I picked the Broncos to win the upset game, and I was going, oh, I'm totally wrong here, and I wish I would have thought of that aspect, that the balance of the Lions was just going to be too much for Vance Joseph and the Broncos defense. Then, you know, Jared Goff gets going. He starts to feel himself. He has no fear throwing the ball into tight windows, and that f- running back Gibbs to go along with it, right? I mean, he's, he's special. He is. He's a home run hitter. Yes. You know, you, B. John Robinson, I know, got drafted before him, but as the season goes on, I, I still go, man, I'm not sure I don't like Gibbs better just because of that straight acceleration and speed. It's a close one, but he's really impressive. So you know my favorite player growing up, Barry Sanders, yeah, of course. course. It was everyone's favorite right. player in Michigan. Right. And there were a couple of runs in this game. I was watching it with my with my nine year old, yeah, and right. I go, I go that run right there. I yeah. was like, that was what it was like right. to watch like Barry Sanders stop and then do this and then reaccelerate a few times. He's got or, the speed to get away to run away from right. players. He's got the shiftiness to make jukes and jives. Yeah, he's a little more like a power runner. He'll he'll lower his shoulder yeah, to the point will. where I'm like, don't do that. Yeah, anymore. Barry wouldn't do that. As yeah, much. yeah, not as much. Only he was he strong, but he was yeah. Right. I, don't, I don't do that. He right. wouldn't put his body at risk. Is why right. he was able to stay as healthy as he did. Yeah, I'm a little concerned for Gibbs, but it's it's multiple guys. 
guys, though. It's it's Gibbs that can make stuff after the catch and make more out of less. They got to keep using them that way. It's Laporta yes. that can make more I mean, out of Laporta less. Is it is phenomenal. Amon Ross St. Brown. It is Jamison Williams, who you your guy, you yeah. called it. Yeah. We saw a couple glimpses of He's it. can make there. more that out of less. a little less. more of an influence on the offense. And so you, you've got a lot of playmakers on the offensive side at the skill position that that make more out of what is there. He is. It's it's the, They got everything you need. We just, like we talked about maybe a month ago, they just need a, somebody to be a little bit of a home run hitter because mm-hmm. everything else is right. you know. And now the O-line kind of being healthy again and all that, right? You look at it and go – yeah, they, they can be real dangerous. Now, I'm still worried about your defense for all the reasons I said before, and I'm not going to sit here and just go, oh, it's fixed just after that game against the Broncos. The Broncos on the offensive side of the ball have not been lighting up the scoreboard. You know, So I'm not trying to squash or you know, rain on your parade yeah, what's there. what's going on here? Well, I'm just saying that I'm not, I'm not sold that your defense is fixed after last week, right? The Broncos through their winning streak were winning 17-14 to 14 and 20-17 to 17 and ugly offense with a play or two from Russell Wilson, right? So it was a good start. It was good. Don't get me wrong. I don't want to uh, make you mad yeah. here in the middle of the podcast. Yeah, well, well yeah. me and but. Melcher23 are mad because he says, damn okay, Lions, looking like the team they've been the majority, all caps of the season. <laughs> all we heard all week was how great Denver has been playing and how we were on upset alert. Yeah. And I, we I crushed so. them. Yeah, you did. And he you goes, and probably them. people are going to say our defense doesn't even look that good now, but it looked great. <laughs> he was thinking that. He didn't write that there. Uh, Lions get the win. You're I can funny. talk about this game forever. But we got to give me the headlines now presented by Hyundai going into the printing press. Got two games for you. We'll start with your Tampa Bay Buccaneers defeating the Green Bay Packers. 34-20 <laughs> is the final <laughs> score. <laughs> your headline for this game is? Yo, ho, yo, ho, the Baker's life for me. <laughs> That's like my favorite song, okay? With the Bucks, like they play that at the stadium. Yeah. So like you're not your favorite song like of all time. It's my favorite song in the Buck Stadium. Okay. Like it's like that it's yeah. like that and like it's from like, Disney and it's what is that? Like Snow yeah. White with the Yo Ho? Okay. It's the Pirates of the Caribbean yeah. when they do it? I don't know if the like Yo Ho song is from that. I feel like the Yo Ho song might be from Snow White. And it might be the okay. seven dwarfs, but I don't know that for okay. sure. But that's number one. These it's are like, the kind of things yeah. we do here at Chris Sims Unbutton. <laughs> we make you smarter in all areas of life. <laughs> yeah. But yeah. that's the song we would play like in between quarters. And we, I always yeah. used to sing it on the sideline. <laughs> I loved it. We make you smarter with information we think is mostly correct. <laughs> right. um, so, We're yeah. Not sure. <laughs> <laughs> Baker was Baker was good in this one. Uh, the play of the game came late. When was that? Uh, 640 to go. It was a touchdown game. Baker Mayfield found David Moore on a third and four in between a couple of Green Bay Packers right. who missed, and then he took off. That was a nice run after the catch. It really was where the, the game turned it's, and the, the Bucks. It's where you felt like yeah, it's officially it. over, right? You were like, that, that's that's going to be all she wrote for the Green Bay Packers. Uh, yeah, the play you're talking about specifically, yeah, you got David Moore running a little what we call a stick route, like a five-yard out route from the slot. Devondre Campbell was all over it. It was one of those yeah. where when Baker was throwing it, you went, <gasps> like, is this going to be an interception? Instead, he gets it in there. David Moore breaks a tackle, and boom, all of a sudden he's off to the races for a 52-yard touchdown. And, yeah, that put them up 14, and that was just too much. The game was extremely exciting in the second half. There a lot of big plays. Love, Baker, Mayfield, third and fourth quarter. They went back and forth, certainly. But I just, you know, uh, the Bucks' defense is, is nothing special. They have some size and some playmakers. But the fact that they were able to adjust here – a little bit. Todd Bowles, I'll give him credit over the last four weeks, got off of his old school defensive coach mentality of like, we're going to run the ball, we're going to run the ball. I think he finally realized like, we're not, we're, we're not a great running team. In fact, we're better when we throw the ball and then we try to run off of that. We get people to be scared of Mike Evans and Chris Godwin. And the big thing to them, and I know we've been talking about this a little lately, third down, I mean, Baker, he loves hanging in there and throwing the ball down the field. And they throw the ball down the field to make big plays. It's not Charlie Checkdown. I mean, when you watch them throughout the day, it's post route, deep cross route, seam routes. We did a thing on, you know, Football Night in America, seams and screens. That's where they're really good. They push you down the field, and defenses are, oh, no, they're beating us deep. They're beating us deep. Then they have a wide receiver screen to Chris Godwin, and all of a sudden he runs for 10 yards before he gets touched because the defense is so deep worried about the deep pass play. So they got a nice little formula working right there and seemed like they got real confidence and mojo going on in Tampa Bay. 
Yeah, uh, Baker Mayfield was uh, good in this one. A perfect passer rating. Modern J has a, has a uh, tweet out there. Can we get a damn okay for Baker Mayfield? Had a 158.3 quarterback rating. QB, QBR, yep, with four touchdown passes in a victory over the passers. He goes, also, Chris, check out my cool Christmas ornament that features Chris. Wow. Oh, wow. Did you know that? So you're you're on an ornament right now if you're I, listening and not watching on Peacock or YouTube. It's me, Cadillac Williams, and Derek Brooks. What are you all doing together? Just kind of looking We're at each other? We're giving each other a high five. We just won a big game. We're going, yeah, f- yeah, we just beat we just beat the Lions, so we're excited. Okay, <laughs> that is an odd. Do you have that, that ornament? I don't have that oh ornament. Oh my god, that is amazing though. And uh, thank you for at Modern J uh, for for showing that and Did sharing. Did you know that, with that us. was out there? Did you know that existed? I, I had seen that before. I feel like somebody sent me a picture of that before. Uh, that you know on social media or somewhere that I, I've seen it. Yes, Modern J. I want to see the face. I want to know how close they got the face to looking like the face that's sitting next to me right now. <laughs> I just want to see. I'm kind of okay. curious. I'm kind of right, curious. We'll get about him. That. That's my better side there. <laughs> my back <laughs> and my ass. Okay. Yeah. yeah. Just right. the hair. Yeah. Yeah. What color was the hair though? Was that I, blonde? I, 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 was well, that? I had my helmet on. I mean, oh, I'm yeah, wearing right. a helmet. I mean, what the hell do you think Sorry, of a football just, player? No, do you have your helmet? Oh yeah, that yeah, is a I helmet. I got my helmet on. Right, it looks like I have a wrinkle in my neck, which that is not real. I don't have wrinkles in my neck, but I'm good. It almost looks like you're wearing a swimmer's cap too. It doesn't necessarily look like a. It was big enough. My head was so big. I had to squeeze that damn helmet on there like it was a swimmer's cap. But way to go, Buck, seriously. Yeah, you know, yeah, yeah. To, where's where's the legs and rear? Is what, is to what to battle back from where they were, you know, not long ago here, three-game win streak, right? Oh, you're moving on from the ornament well, talk I'm just, here. Yeah, I am. I'm moving on okay. to real football. Uh, but I'm, I really am impressed with the Bucks, And, you know, to win the game last week against Atlanta the way they did it, you know, again, to go up to Green Bay. Green Bay didn't give up. You know, they fought. They tried to stay in this one. Green Bay's defense is disappointing. The way they were gashed a little, you know, in the second half last week against the Giants and now, you know, to, to let up that many big plays against the Buccaneers, kind of disappointing for the Green Bay talent altogether. Yeah, exactly. Real quick on Green Bay, they yeah. allowed 450 or more yards for the second time this season. PFT Ghost wants to know, Sims, please convince me why Joe Barry should be the Packers' defensive coordinator. I know Godwin and Evans is a terrible matchup for our banged-up secondary, but in too many games it just feels like we're not changing to stop what offenses are doing. Yeah, I, I, I don't disagree with that. You know, I think injuries, I, you know, the other thing I will at least stick up for Joe Barry is injuries, and they have a lot of young players on their football team. So I do think there's things that are blown or messed up at times uh, as well. But uh, I think anybody that's been listening to this podcast for the majority of the year, you've heard me say, you know, I'm a little underwhelmed with the Packers defense for the talent that it has. It's, it's, it has had too many, you know, average-looking offenses move the ball on them. Um, yeah, disappointing today. Here down the home stretch, especially you win that Chiefs game and you're going, wait, they seem like they're rounding into something here. They even started the Giants game off on the defensive side of the ball really good, uh, but it's, it's, it's all falling apart. And, of course, now they're in deep trouble of not being able to make the playoffs. All right, to wrap up a loose end, Yo-Ho, A Pirate's Life for Me. Yes. Pete has looked this up. Yes. Is a theme song for the Pirates of the Caribbean oh, attractions okay. at it Disney is, theme parks. It, is that. it did not appear in a Disney movie. You are thinking right. of Hi-Ho, Hi-Ho, It's oh, Off to Work We Go right. from Snow White. He's, he is right about that. Way to go, Pete. Good, <laughs> good research by you. Which been, I think is the same like sound. Hi yeah. ho, hi. Oh no, it's not the same. It's close. It's similar. It's close. It's very it's close. Very close. Right. So yeah, and you know, now that I'm saying that, I was like, I kind of remember it. It was the Pirates of the Caribbean yeah. theme thing. We so. we eventually get to the right answer. Yeah, it just right. takes us a long time. Yeah. Sometimes multiple pods. <laughs> uh, Saints defeat your New York Giants. Yours and Pete's. Uh, your headline for this game is. Hey, go get your shine box, okay? That's why You don't even know what that means, get your shine box. No clue. Hey, Tommy, go get your shine box, all right? So it's from Goodfellas, uh-huh. right? Joe Pesci's a baller, you know, wise guy. Okay. But when he was younger, he was shining shoes. Some wise guy got out of jail, and he's like, oh, you're a big shot now. I used to remember you when you shine shoes, right? So he kind of like, they kind of go at it a little bit, and then he throws one more zinger at him. He goes, tell me, go get your shine box okay so tommy devito's the quarterback of the giants right we thought it was a good play on words and tommy is the name of the character in the, in the movie. movie his name's tommy devito he gets shot in the back of the head and dies Wait, the name's the tommy devito yes in the movie yes good fellas it's a classic <laughs> watch it okay yeah all right yeah okay but that's okay, why okay. we brought it out and yeah. uh yeah so what we're basically saying is the tommy devito magic kind of got squashed what was in he this s- football game overall. What was what? he supposed to do? Seven sacks? Exactly. 
No, that's why, you know, I know. It's, that's, we're having fun with it. He You're got right. whacked. It was a disaster. He did. He got whacked, but, like, literally whacked by, like, big, angry defensive lineman who wanted to tear his head off. Um, you know, it, uh, it's the Giants, uh, yeah, offense, we know it's not great, right? I mean, uh, cool what he did against Washington and what he did last week. I think there's some of me that would go last week against the Packers that go, what the hell were they doing? Is what I want to say more than, oh, wow, great Tommy DeVito, right? You know, the Saints didn't do so. You know, they didn't do some of the or mistakes, I should say, of the teams that they, they played the last few weeks. They weren't going to let them run the football. DeVito wasn't going to scramble, right? That was probably their biggest thing of the football game. And, you know, what happened is the Giants – couldn't get out of their own area of the field. So the, the Saints had field position for a majority of the game. It wasn't like the Saints were some juggernaut on the offensive side of the ball. They weren't. But kind of like we talked about a minute ago with like playing it the right way, the Dolphins, the Saints were the same way. They're like, well, we got this offense on hold. Let's just – we'll dink and dunk and we'll be a little conservative and we'll slowly start to wear them down and win this game easily. And uh, that's basically what happened when all said and done. Giants Giants offense just not good enough to move the ball in the Saints defense. And Giants D, respectable. But, you know, like we always talk about, you're putting that many bad positions over and over and over. You know, you're going to start to, to fall apart as the yeah. game goes on. I think we have been a little reluctant on this podcast to give the Saints uh, their due. Yeah. They're 7-7 seven and seven right now, so we'll let uh, Tomas Pena – do that. He goes damn okay, Derek Carr. With the yeah. Saints offense playing their season high percentage of play action, Carr had his best game. I just can't believe it took them so damn long to understand that a bit more play action would lead to more open throws in the middle and better pass protection. Agreed. Agreed. You know, I haven't got the run game ever going maybe to the point they wanted to this year. All right. Had a little success with that today. Hopefully they can stay with it. I think that's one way they will get Derek Carr to push the ball down the field a little bit is with the play action. Right. When he drops back, he's again a little too conservative for me at times, like you've heard me say. But I think he's so he's so good at going through the reads too. He's just like, oh, one, two, three, four, oh, boom, there, there he is. You know? And he goes like when it's a play action pass, it's like, oh wait, we're keeping people in the block. As I tell you, it slows the pass rush down for a second. Sometimes it clears out the picture downfield a little bit more to where now Derek Carr, who can be a little conservative, can feel a little bit more confident about throwing the ball down the field. We'll see where it goes. Yeah. Again, you know, it's not been sexy, and we don't certainly need to, to put it down, but between his play, the weapons they have on the field and all that, I don't think we're crazy in saying that they've been a little underwhelming on that side of the ball. Let's see if this can be a, a, a jump-off point for them in that, that offense. The Bucks and the Saints both at 7-7, seven to seven, tied atop the NFC South. They both kind of maintain control of their path to a title there because they play each other coming up here in two weeks. They and play so each other will... two weeks. The Saints got the Rams this week. Yeah. That's going to be awesome on Thursday night. That's going to go a long way to the playoffs, right? The Saints have a double way they can still get in. They can still win the South, and they can still maybe be the seventh seed with the way things are going. So they have a few more avenues of a team like, hey, the Rams, who I know we're going to talk about in a minute, right? They got to win as a wild card because they ain't catching the 49ers in the West. And that was Give Me the Headlines presented by Hyundai. We are just about to go final in our Sunday night game. You ready to talk about it? Do you have some things yeah, to say sure, about this sure. one right here? All right. It is 19 seconds left, but I'm calling it right now. It's over. It's final. The Baltimore Ravens have gone to Duval County and defeated Trevor Lawrence and Doug Peterson and the Jacksonville Jaguars. They're doing the handshake right now. 23-7 to was the final score. I did see Keaton Mitchell had an injury. It, it was like horrible. A lower, oh, no. It was really? horrible. His, I didn't want to stop you in the middle of the thing, but we were seeing replays. I don't think they showed the replay on the show. Oh, no. He actually got up and limped off the field. His knee totally bent the wrong way. Oh, no. To where I was like, oh, no. But somehow he had, you know, his hands over two people, limped off the field and got on the cart, but I can't imagine that it's good. It stinks for them because, you know, he's, he's pretty special again. But, um, you know, Good win for the Ravens. Again, I don't think it was their best football by any stretch of the imagination, right? It kind of felt like they were outplayed in the first half, even though they were up 10 nothing. When you kind of take into account that Jaguars missed two field goals, the Jaguars were driving another time, and Trevor Lawrence just dropped the balls. He was scrambling down the left sideline. The Ravens recovered that. So, you know, some issues there overall. But, I mean, Ravens clearly one of the best teams in the AFC. We know that. 
And there's still a lot to respect there. I think the all, all in all, what I worry about the Ravens, I want them to continue to run the ball the traditional way. I think it's, you know, studying them all week, right? Did a little extra studying for them because they were on our game for football night and Sunday night, Ameri Sunday night football where they still get too pass happy at times. They're at their best when they're close to balance, maybe 60-40, you know, past the run or 55-45. You know, there's too many times in the game where I go, damn, it's shotgun and we threw the ball. It's eight times in a row now. You got this big old line and a pretty good run scheme. Like, let's not forget about that. And then, of course, Lamar's ability to keep the ball or just the threat of him is going to make them a good running team, you know? Like Jason Garrett was saying earlier, he goes, damn, if they just would run the Lamar runs two or three times a game, that's all they got to do. Because then defense is, it'll keep them off of everything else they want to do on the offense. So that I would like to see them be that way a little bit more. Lamar continues to make big plays with his right arm. He did have a bad interception in this one. Uh, th here's my concern with the Ravens. They're going to be fine against, of course, the majority of football. But when they play... A creative offense like McVay last week with the Rams and a quarterback that is not overwhelmed by the illusion of complexity of the Ravens or the, you know how we talk about there's six guys at the line of scrimmage. It seems like they're all blitzing, but only four blitz and two drop out and do all that stuff, right? That's where I worry about them. The Ravens can't rush the pressure with their front four and they can't play man coverage in the back end. And so, therefore, it's relying on the D coordinator a lot to trick it up and create the pressures. And like I said, it'll work against most teams in football. I'm just not sold it's going to work against the cream of the crop in the NFL. And that's just what worries me about them, uh, you know, going forward. Uh, the Baltimore Ravens are the first AFC team to clinch a playoff berth with this win. There was a little controversy at the end of the game, apparently. Yeah, the touchdown like Kelvin catch. Kelvin Ridley caught right. a touchdown in the back of the end zone. Terry McCauley, our rules analyst, yeah. said it should have stood as a touchdown right. or counted as a touchdown. It was a really tough one. They said it didn't. That was pretty late, though. It was late. It didn't really mean anything either way. It would still need another nine. Yes, right, but the, they, they, he caught the ball in the back of the end zone. But see, and then we're showing the picture here if you want to check it out. But – he is bobbling the ball here in this process, too. So there was a little bit of a double whammy. It was like, I think the control aspect was really the thing. Like, the ball was moving a little bit. So it was like, wait, the ball's allowed to move, right? As long as you have control. But it was a little bit of like, wait, does he have control? I don't, it was close. I really thought it was close. I wasn't shocked to see them call it a no touchdown. You worried about the Jacksonville Jaguars at all? I am. I am. In fact, they they've have lost, some well, of the, They've lost three in a row now. Yeah. But they, Bengals, they, Browns, and now the Ravens. They have some of the same problems the Ravens do on defense. One, they had some injuries on defense in the secondary tonight. Two, they're another team that can't get to the quarterback with their front four. They can't get there. So they want to blitz and do all that. They want to play zone primarily, right? But – yeah, they're, they're falling apart in that department a little bit. And without Tyson Campbell, they don't want to play man-to-man -man at all. And he was, of course, out of this football game as well. All right? And then offensively, as you've heard me say, I like their offense. I really do. Um, I still think they got to find ways to make explosive plays, throwing the ball down the field, come up with a few plays like that throughout. But, yeah, they're in a little bit of a lull right now. Uh, and, and, you know, again, seven points tonight, but the two missed field goals, the Trevor Lawrence fumble – uh, you know, the not capitalizing and the Calvin Ridley touchdown, leaving, you know, getting no points there. They move the ball better than the points are going to say at the end of the day. But they can't run the ball. The mm -hmm. O-line injuries have come back to beat them or bite them in the ass, I should say. It's not the same O-line as last year. There's no Juwan Taylor. Cam Robinson's out. They've had injuries. So the run game, last year they could create big plays in the pass game because – one, they had an explosive run game, Ahmed. And then two, of course, the play-action pass came off of it. But now they can't run the ball. The play-action pass doesn't have the same effect. And, uh, yeah, I'm a little worried about Jacksonville. I am. It's really interesting in yeah. the AFC South right now because it's Jacksonville 8-6, right. and six, Indianapolis 8-6, and six, Houston 8-6. and six. Let's go to those games right now as we go to the wild-card hopefuls. Whoa. And who knows, maybe one of these teams is a division winner hopeful still. Got the same record. The Texans beat the Houston Oilers. It was Houston versus Houston with famed Houston Cougar uh, uh, Case Keenum at quarterback. Yeah, too. It was seriously. Houston well, everywhere. I didn't even think of that angle. You're right. The game should have been in Houston, uh, but it was in Nashville. <laughs> Brable wore his bum <laughs> Phillips hat before the game. Oh, I, saw, I did yeah. see that. So that yeah. was kind of cool. Uh, that was awesome. And, you know, J.J. Watt said after the game, he goes, we get the uniforms back. 
So now the Houston Texans, that's what he said. That's how it works. I don't make the rules. Sorry, not sorry. Too bad. So sad. So now he thinks that the Houston Texans can claim the Houston Oilers. <laughs> I, explaining this to my son took a long time. Yeah. It took a long time. Right. I, I'm sure it did. Uh, they look great in those uh, old school Oiler uniforms. It, th- those you know, and maybe it's yeah. just because we grew up in that time now, and we will always think yeah. uniforms from the late '80s, early '90s, mid '90s look the best. But it's like one of those that if they just could have won a Super Bowl, they would have never got rid of them. But it's like like the Broncos or some of the other teams, it gets associated with losing, and they go, "We want to shit like the Eagles." We all, everybody liked the Eagles of the uniforms in the '80s better, but they couldn't win. And they were associated with losing, so they went on to something new. You know, now they win with the new uniforms. They're like, wait, the old uniforms aren't that bad. Wait, what about those? <laughs> yeah. Why do why we switch? Well, because uh, we couldn't win anything. But uh, I, w- like what what can you say about the Texans? I mean, they had every right to kind of fold up the tent today. Got down early, battle back, battle back like slow and ugly, too. I mean, it wasn't easy. It was a field goal fest. But defense just totally shut down the Titans. I mean, first drive, Titans put it together. You know, Levis, they get the offsides penalty, free play. He throws a ball down the left sideline. I believe it was to Chris Moore that set them up maybe about the one-yard line uh, to, for Will Levis to run in and score. But, I mean, I'm, I'm, like, I'm not joking. Like, after that, I don't know if I remember seeing the Titans move the ball on a sustained drive the rest of the game. I mean, really. I don't remember seeing a whole lot, that's for sure. Levis certainly seemed like he couldn't find people open. There was no explosive plays in the pass game. The run game was non-existent. I mean, I was joking with Matt Casey and everybody. At one point, like, you know, Derrick Henry had like 12 carries for six yards. He was going backwards. Uh, but to do that without C.J. Stroud, no Tank Dell, no Ninko Collins, no Will Anderson, you know, I think just kind of talks about, you know, D'Amico and what he's instilled in that locker room and the belief they have right now. I think that's the most important thing. Yeah, in overtime especially, uh, both defensive lines really took over. I mean, was, neither quarterback had a whole lot of time. No. Will Levis got knocked out of the game. Uh, I, he was walking around on the sideline. It, it seemed like it might be worse than it actually is, so hopefully I don't know what the latest news is on, on Will Levis. But um, forced him to punt, led to that late field goal drive and some big plays by the – by the Houston Texans, but I think you're right. I think you, I think D'Amico Ryan's has got to be in that conversation. They're tough. Now. They're gritty. Yeah, he deserves to be in that conversation. I think the 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 other big thing with Houston is just that their O line's pretty healthy, right? And they they we're seeing them run the ball consistently, like week in and week out, right now. So that that helped them kind of hold down the fort. And as the game went on, you know, Case Keenum got in a little bit of a rhythm and started to make some plays in the pass game. Uh, no, Noah Brown, Dalton Schultz, whatever, and they made it work. But I think the thing I'm most impressed with, with with Houston over the last few weeks is their run game. Devin Singletary, what he's been doing, right? The win against the Broncos, he ran the ball really well. Uh, I want to say even the the yeah maybe it wasn't the the the. Well, let's see, what did they miss in between there? The Jets game, well, they didn't do shit on that side of the ball. So it's been two of the last three games they've got the run game going at least. Yeah, you're right. After their first two drives, their first drive, they got 83 yards. They got 32 yards on their second drive. They didn't have another drive that went over 26. Is that right? Yeah, I was. I mean, I was going to say. I mean, it was. I was going to go like. I don't remember them getting first downs really a lot of the times. Yeah. Uh, and it, not like Houston was having an easy time moving the ball either. But Case Keenum, the offense, the s- system they have. Yeah, they found ways to kind of slowly pick apart Tennessee for a few drives, get themselves in field goal position, and uh, Fairburn was clutch all day long. So Houston is 8-6. and six. The Indianapolis Colts are 8-6. and six. They got the win on Saturday versus the slumping Pittsburgh Steelers, 30-13. to 13. Fight or fall, 37, says Dam OK for the Colts' backup running backs, taking full advantage of the opportunity on Saturday with Zach Moss getting hurt in the game. Uh, Trey Sermon, 17 carries for 88 yards. Got Goodson then, went uh, 11 carries for 69 yards a couple out of the backfield receiving as well so uh the backup running which me which speaks to this Colts offensive line that we thought maybe last year was on the way on the way down right right. they're they're having a good year they definitely are having a good year and I think um you know oddly enough when I started to sing their praise like three weeks ago they went on like a little cold spell but they got back I mean I you know I think there was a part in the game last night where they cracked the code really I, I, it, it felt like it. It felt like Shane Steichen had found something within the way the Steelers were playing and packaging run pass game together where it, 
it became just too easy. I mean, it just felt like the, the, the Indianapolis Colts offense was capable of getting five or six yards on every play. I mean, again, it wasn't like big explosive plays throughout the night. I felt like it was a lot of five and eight and five and eight. Oh, and there's 20 and five and eight and 12. Oh, okay. I mean, that's where Shane Steichen's really damn good. And, yeah, they got the run game going. Run game going. The Najee Harris fumble, right, backed up. That was the moment where you were just like, whoa, this game's going to get a little dicey here now. You know, the Steelers, they don't want to get into now we're trailing and we're going to have to throw the ball. And, you know, now the other team can be a little more patient on that side of the ball and run the ball. They're not great at stopping the run. It's just it ended up being a game that, you know, is not conducive to the Steelers winning the football game. But, you know, all in all, I mean, again, we say all we want. I don't give a shit who's that quarterback. That Steelers offense stinks. Trubisky, for a guy that's played as much as he has, he still makes some throws and decisions where you're just like, what? You know? I want to say it was the one to Justin Blackman, that interception, where I just want to go like, yeah, how could you throw that? You, you're, you've played too long to do stuff like that. Uh, Steelers are really reeling, and it feels like they're kind of falling apart. Yeah, every year it feels like the last few weeks of the season there are a few teams they should stop. It's just like, you know what, like they don't want to play anymore. Their fans don't want to see him play anymore. You know, he did say, Mike Tomlin, after the game, he goes, we're going to do things differently next week. But I was like, what can they do differently? There's not. I mean, like, what what does he mean by that? I don't know either. I guess I'm guessing he means something with practice habits or whatever. I know he went on a long rant about them not doing the little things right, tackling. I'm sure there was, you know, I when he said that, I want to go. No, he's frustrated because Shane Steichen cracked the code on his defense and they couldn't do anything right because, you know, they were getting hit with run here, throw here, run here, run here again. I mean, it was the, they couldn't stop anything. Um, but, yeah, they're, they're, they have totally lost their confidence as a football team, and it seems like they're going in the wrong direction. The Colts, however, they're going to be a pain in the butt. I don't think they're you know, world beaters or anything like that. But you know, you've heard me say that O-line, that D-line, Gardner can splash play a few plays here to me. To me, the biggest thing for them will be the run game. Right, If they can just be like they were the other night and run the ball like that, that's how we're not riding Gardner Minshew too much, and that will tend to lend itself some other plays in the pass game that you know are, are easy to strike on for that Colts offense. Indy might have the hardest schedule of the three 8-6 and six teams in the AFC South. Jacksonville's at Tampa, but then they got Carolina, then they're at Tennessee. That might be the easiest. Indy is at Atlanta, Las Vegas, and then Houston. Houston's got Cleveland the Titans, and then at Indianapolis. Mm, that's the, They might have the toughest one there yeah. at the end, right? Jacksonville's for sure got the easiest. Yeah, yeah. It's, but we'll see. Uh, it will be, it'll be interesting to see where it goes. You know, uh, a healthy Texans team, the way they've played, I want to say they're going to take the bull by the horns, per se, if the C.J. Stroud's back and Nico Collins is back and all that, but we'll see where that goes. You know, to me, uh, you know, the last five to six weeks, I think on a week-to-week basis – it feels like Houston's been the best, right? I know they laid that egg up in New York in the, the Jets game and the rain and all that, you know, but, but other than that, it just felt like they were kind of, you know, going in the right direction and continuing to get better. We'll see if C.J. Stroud can get back healthy and, and kind of hit the ground running the way he was before he got injured. You're right. The Texans do play the Browns coming up next week. Speaking of the Browns. Oh, man. They beat the Bears 20-17. to It's my man crush team right here right now. The Cleveland Browns. Let's go inside the numbers on yeah. this one powered by AWS, and we'll immediately look at the win probability chart because this one was, was insane. All over the place. Yeah, the Browns' win probability was as low as 10%. When they trailed 17 to 7 with 55 seconds remaining in the third quarter. So here's the chart. And the funniest thing about this chart is that we could have had a spike again to the top. <laughs> Seriously. If Darnell Mooney had just caught the ball that was lying in right. his lap on the Hail Mary. So it could have gone all the way from there to above, just a bit like a, like a true heartbeat, um, which we, it's just crazy. It's like. I almost think that Hail Mary plays now. You're just going to see all the receiving team just lie on the ground in the end well, zone. Well, there's always one guy that tries to play for that. It's down there, waiting to like a volleyball for the, player. Because they know that the defense is taught to knock the ball down. So they're going, I'm going to play right here to where you knock it down and do that. Right? So, yeah, I, I wouldn't be shocked if we continue to see more people in that position. To just go, oh, they want to play that? Then we're going to have two guys here for that. 
It was close. It really was. He almost went crazy in the viewing room. He caught it and then kicked it out of his own hand as he was kind of bumbling it and lost control of it. Ended up being an interception. But how about this stat? Yeah. The Browns now have a league-high four wins in games where their win probability dropped below 15%. That's incredible. This season, and the hero in this one was Joe Flacco and David Njoku. They made some big plays down I, the I know. I wish I could throw three picks in a game and they say I'm a hero of the game. <laughs> uh, it's it's Amazing, right? <laughs> yeah. But well, if you're no, old, it's like did. expectations are super low. It is, and he made some big plays. There's d- no doubt about that. He did. Now, some of his interceptions were bad. We'll get into that in a second. I love watching Cleveland play. I do. I don't know if it's sustainable with what they're doing right now. And like we talked about last week and even the week before that. I mean, it's the three games in a row. It's mid-40s with Joe Flacco throwing the football. And you know what? I, I don't think they're going to be able to run the ball like we – you know, would like to see them with, you know, of course, the no Nick Chubb, the offensive line is decimated with injuries, so they have issues there. So they have to throw the ball. I do wish they would manage it a little bit differently, right? I don't think there's, like, if they're a little bit more conservative on the offensive side of the ball, I don't think there's any way the Bears can beat the Browns today, right? To me, the game was a game because the Browns and Joe Flacco are just a little too aggressive and careless, they're a team that at times I want to go, wait, you guys know you have the number one defense in football, right? You, you know that, right? That, I swear they forget sometimes. And th- so I wish they would play that way instead of like always, I don't know. I know it's attack and it's aggressive and all that. I respect it. But I, I think they got to realize you got a guy who's a little older at playing quarterback who's been pretty famous the last few years for turning the ball over, like period. So you got to watch it. If you call a deep throw with Joe Flacco – He's going to throw it whether he's covered or not. That's what I've learned. Like, there was a few in this game where it's like, a, just, he's triple covered. It's a post corner. Doesn't matter. He's throwing it. It's a deep shot. He's going to throw it. So you've got to manage him a little. That scares me. But having said that, I have a man crush on their defense. I really do. Like you heard me talk about with the Jets a few minutes ago, right? The, the Cleveland Browns play every play like, this is the last play of the game and we can't let them get a yard. Right, so that that allows the other team to make some big plays and fun to watch. But every play by the Browns' defense is shut them down and make them go for negative yards, which I just have great respect for. I mean, Matt Casey will tell you, or some of the people in the viewing room will tell you. There's points in the game where I'm going, look, are you looking at this? It's second and seven, and there's nine guys at the line of scrimmage, and they're playing bum man to man, and there it's like, is it fourth and one on the goal line for the Super Bowl, or are we like? You're winning the game against the Bears, right? So I love their way they approach it. And they're winning games because of their defensive defensive side of the football. Yeah. And then Flacco, of course, is making some big plays. But, again, the Chicago Bears got a pick six touchdown and another interception that was returned inside the five-yard line. And that's how they scored both their touchdowns. And then, of course, a field goal by Santos on one other drive, which was kind of a field position drive together, all together as well uh, for the Bears. So that defense is phenomenal. And, um, yeah, they, they make so many plays week in and week out. But, yeah. like, don't be too careless and crazy with Joe Flacco letting him throw the ball all over the place and thinking you're getting 2012 Joe Flacco that was the quarterback of the Ravens. Yeah, he's 58 years old. Just give him some credit <laughs> for being out there. That was inside the numbers powered by – AWS. One thing on the Bears, too. Yeah, Justin right. Fields, watching him play this year. Yeah, I know. He doesn't seem quite as explosive as a runner as mm. he was last year yeah. at times. I don't know if there's anything to that. I mean, he had seven carries for 30 yards, but I, I normally you just expect him to break one and have one of those runs where just like no one's catching him. I know. I don't know if he's had that many this well, year. Well, he hasn't had as many. It, it goes away fast, that, that ultra top gear for mm. guys like a quarterback. First off, he's a quarterback. He's not running sprints and receiver every day, right? Also, he's getting hit a lot. I don't care who you are. I mean, we all talked about last year, this year. He takes a lot of hits. That's going to slow you down. But the other thing I'll say with today and all that is Cleveland's defense is so fast. They're going to make a lot of quarterbacks not look as fast as they should be. The biggest moment of this football game, the Bears were up 17-7. to They had the ball at the 33-yard line. They could have kicked a 50-yard field goal to possibly go up 20-7. to Justin Fields fakes the run up the middle. He boots around to the right. And I want to say it was Cam Mitchell, rookie from Northwestern, who we talked about in the draft a little bit. He makes the big play to shoestring tackle him, gets him short of the sticks there. 
And that was, the, at least in my opinion, the play that saved the day for the Browns to, to keep it a 10-point game and allow them to battle back. Miles Garrett, seven more pressures for him in this one. And maybe now that Tyreek, you know, is losing a little luster in the MVP talk now because they <laughs> you, scored 30 without him, maybe we're going to get Miles Garrett back in <laughs> you there. You love that. Uh, the Cincinnati Bengals. <laughs> 290 yards of total offense, and you're telling me that you're killing it. <laughs> I just got to keep this narrative kind of interesting. Uh, the Bengals beat the Vikings in overtime. What a comeback. 27-24 in this one. There were so many big plays down the end, and uh, I don't want to give all the credit to the quarterback because uh, Jake Browning was good, but – T. Higgins reaching out at the goal line to what put a the ball play, over. Right? What a play. What a play. And you got Tyler Boyd. What a play in yeah. overtime setting up the game-winning field goal. That's so right. Some individual efforts by those receivers in a game where uh, Jamar Chase got hurt in and came yeah. out. Right? A little so, shoulder issue, it sounds um, like. What do you, what'd you make of this one, the Bengals coming back? Well, it's the uh, Bengals. It was awesome, the comeback and all that. I'm going to go to one of my lines you usually hear me say. Did, mm. Did the Bengals win or did the Vikings lose? Ooh, okay. I, I'm kind of uh, more of the Vikings lost, right? Uh, that, that to me, the Vikings went in at halftime up 7-3 and probably should have been up 21-3, to right? And how many times have we seen that this year? But you don't take advantage of your domination of a football game and let a team kind of hang around and do that. I mean, that game, you know, you, you take away then the way the start of the third quarter. I mean, they, they should have been up by three touchdowns. You know, they're up 17-3 instead, and they let a team that's had championship merit kind of hang around. And Browning started to get in a little bit of a rhythm. I think the Vikings got a little like, hey, it's 17-3. to We don't need to be quite as aggressive and be crazy. So you get stuck in that, hey, let's not let the big play. Let's be a little conservative. But what happens when that happens is it's usually bland coverages, and the quarterback starts to, oh, pick you apart for five or pick you apart for eight. And all of a sudden the defensive coordinator goes, man, we're being picked apart for five or eight. Hey, let's call a defense to stop that little slot out route. And all of a sudden, Jay, Browning looks at that and goes, oh, wow, the in cut behind it's open for 20. And all of a sudden, shit just starts to snowball out of, out of control. And that's kind of seems like what had happened with the Vikings. I mean, Nick Mullins did some good things. They ran the ball. I mean, but both interceptions down there, the th interception where he just threw the ball, I think it was to Mike Hilton, the first one, down the middle, that was shocking. And then to be driving again and, what, inside the 20, around the 20, you know, just fall down and take the sack. I know they're telling you not to take sacks, but when you're, in the, when you're on the way to the ground already, you can't just throw the ball. And then, you know, B.J. Hill gets the interception. So some monumental mistakes by the Vikings, really, uh, because it felt like they outplayed Cincinnati. But credit to Cincinnati for hanging around and, and making the plays when they had to. Bengals got a stop fourth and inches there with a quarterback sneak That's right. after a stop on third oh, and short the double, two. the double tush push. Yeah. They did it two plays in a row. They were like, it's right. got to work one of these times. Well, I, you know, again, it's, it's, it is Nick Mullins. Okay, we'll say that. And Minnesota, you haven't run the ball or pushed anybody around all year. I mean, I know you were having a good day in this day, but that's not who you are. Like, that was a little – I was a little surprised with the second time in a row. I definitely was. But despite the loss for Minnesota – They're still in it. 7-7, seven and seven, yep. the sixth seed currently in the NFC. Right. And the uh, L.A. Rams right behind them. The seventh seed also at 7-7. Seven and seven. They got a win, 28-20. to 20, Not as close as the score indicated, I would say, in this one. Uh, they have won four of their last five games, and their offense is cooking. It's They've cooking. scored 28 or more in the, the last four games. Um, Mike Floyd tweets into us – says, are the Rams a contender if they make the playoffs? Ooh, I think they're – it's a good It's a good question. Because, like, like, a few weeks ago, I, I would have been like, the Rams, if they get in, they could maybe pull off an upset. The way that I've seen them play since then, I, it's only gotten better. The loss against the Ravens didn't make me feel worse. It made me feel better about them, Right. I mean, it did. So I, I look at it, and then you look at the state of, okay, the Cowboys today, the Philadelphia Eagles, who haven't been playing good for six or seven weeks now, really. Like, you just start to look at it, and you go, wait, is it crazy to think that the Rams go on the road and win the wild card game against, who knows, some shitty NFC South team? And then the next week they go to a Philadelphia or something like that and win the game? I don't think that's crazy. Yeah, I wouldn't bet on it. But I, I, I don't think it's crazy. I think here's the story for a lot of yeah. NFC teams. Yeah. It's like they can win a couple games until they play the 49ers. Just avoid the 49ers. <laughs> I was literally about to say the same thing I was, because I was going to go, if they got to go play the 49ers in the divisional playoff game, they'll be a pain in their ass. 
because they know Shanahan as well as anybody. But, you know, I, where, where, you know, of course their defense is well coached. You know I think Stafford's the man. And then I continue to be blown away by their run game. I'm blown away by it. I mean, I really am. Williams had 152 it's, yards. It's like a weekly thing now. They just run the ball on whoever they want. So that's where I go and go, yeah, you know, you can run the ball, playoffs, a, a Super Bowl quarterback in Stafford, those two guys he can throw the ball to, and then somebody like Raheem Morris who can go, wait, I can come up with a crazy deep plan, deep defensive game plan to shut down this offense this week or at least give them issues. That's where I'd give them a fighting a chance. So, you know, yeah, they could definitely upset the apple cart in the NFC playoff picture and spoil us maybe of a – a matchup we wanted to see in the NFC Championship game. One more game to talk about from Sunday. This is crazy. Usually at this point in the year, we get to these last games, we're like, yeah, this game doesn't mean anything for anything. It's like uh, we're still talking about a potential playoff team in the Atlanta Falcons, although they may be fading fast. They lose to the Carolina Panthers. 9-7 to was the final score. Eddie Pinheiro with the 23-yard field goal. As time expired, Bryce Young, what was that? It was a 90-yard drive, right, after another bad turnover. Bijan Robinson fumbled before that earlier in the game. Right. So that set them up for one easy field, a six six play, seventeen yard drive. I mean, Carolina couldn't do shit. They didn't do anything. They fumble in their own area and let them get a two first downs and kick a field goal. They drive down at the end of the game. And I would just like to say, as you guys are if you're watching on the video, this is Matthew Casey, the producer of our football night. <laughs> Dead America. tired. He's putting his coat on. He's like, I don't need to hear about the Well, Panthers and he, and knows he knows I'm about to, he knows what I'm about to say. <laughs> as the Falcons were driving on that last drive, as drive started, and I said, this drive has bad Desmond Ritter interception <laughs> written oh. all over it. Oh, man. It was, it was raining hard. He had had a few plays in the game already where I was like, oh, my God, that was what is he doing? But you were getting nervous. They were down in the red zone, though. They were, they were down. Like, well, I, I, I kind of root for Atlanta. I want them to do good. I think it's cool to watch a team without the superstar quarterback kind of win games and win a division and play defense and run the ball. Like, So there's things I like, and I like their team. But he throws a ball. They're in field goal range. Like – they're not going to go down and score a touchdown. You kick another field goal. Like, the game's over. You go up 10-6, it's over. He throws a ball running to his left and tries to throw it across his body to a guy coming across the field and throws such a bad interception. And not only so bad, it's, it's, it's horrible, let alone the guy behind him is about to intercept the ball. I mean, there's three people where you go, when he's throwing the ball, I'm going – they're all going to intercept it. It's just who does it get to first? So it's just, you know, I feel for the, the Falcons because they're really a playoff caliber football team. They just got a quarterback who's not there yet. And I don't want to say he's not ever going to get there because he's done some good things. And he throws a pretty nice ball. He like does. You see some he of those has plays moments where you go, wow, good. that looks good, right? Look at him move, standing in there, making a big throw. Made a lot of big throws last week. It's just playing quarterback in the NFL is good. It's a frustrating thing. My first game ever, I was like, damn, I feel like I'm playing awesome. We're going up and down the field, right? I was, I'm like, well, we're, I'm, I'm feeling good. I'm moving the ball in the Carolina Panthers and blah, 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 right? I make one mistake, one. It's a pick six, and all of a sudden I look up and I go, we're losing 27 to 14 now. And, like, the game's out of control, and I played perfect. And that's what's hard about quarterback in the NFL. That's why they make $45 million a year because it's, <laughs> like, one mistake, and the game is for everybody. Yeah. And that's what's on your shoulders for the most part. And Unless you're Joe Flacco. You could throw three, and the team still wins. <laughs> and you're the you're being called a hero <laughs> on Chris right. Sims Unbuttoned. Yeah, AWS sponsor segment. Here you go. You're inside the numbers. Sponsored by AWS. Yeah. <laughs> all right. That is all the Sunday games, but we do not want to forget what happened with the Raiders, a team that got shut out in a 3 <laughs> nothing game. I don't remember anymore. This is insane. How, how do you go from getting shut out? I think right? there are many multiple records right. made in this one. Uh, and then they scored 63 against the Chargers. While I was in the Dominican, I couldn't watch this game because they, I don't know how did that works. Um, but I, when I saw the score, I was like, that's it. That's it for, for Brendan Staley. I was like, I didn't know it was going to be now, but I was like, there's no way you come back no, from this. Right. And there was no way you came back from there this. There was no way. There was like, I want to say, I don't know if it was the the 14 nothing touchdown. It might have been the 21 nothing touchdown after um, Kelly fumbled, right? Stick had fumbled the drive before. 
to give the Raiders the short field touchdown. Now they get it back, and it's 14 nothing Raiders. You're like, okay, the Chargers got to get something going here. And I think it was the first play, Joshua Kelly fumbled. And then they scored like a few plays later. And I remember looking at my wife to like your point of what you're saying, and I went, oh, my gosh, I can't get over this. And I'm going to my wife. I go, you know they didn't score a point last week, this team? And she's like, who? And I'm like, the Raiders. They didn't score last week. And I was going, you could see it, though. My point was when they went up 21 nothing. I said, oh, he's getting fired tomorrow, definitely. And you could tell the air was out on the football oh, wow. team. They were, like, drunk on their feet or knocked out on their feet, wobbly, right? They, the, they totally lost intensity of the football game and were just, like, as much as of a give up of a football team as you'll see in the NFL. I don't want to say anybody gave up, but, you know, balls to the walls, crazy intensity, right? That certainly was not happening anymore. And, you know, Brandon Staley lost his team, I think, a few weeks ago. Uh, and uh, ashamed to see it all go that way. But, yeah, they're underperforming, of course, for the talent they have on their team. Will be maybe the most coveted job because you've got the quarterback there. He'll heal up from his uh, finger injury, and there are going to be a lot of people that want that job. A hundred percent. they got a quarterback. they got a few good receivers. they got some good old linemen. They're a little older maybe, yeah. and some of the talent maybe is overstated. I would I don't disagree with you there. I don't disagree with you. You're right. I mean, yes, you, you know me. I love Keenan Allen. I don't think he's a superstar. I think he's a guy that works the middle of the field. He's an awesome number two, right? Right. The Quentin Johnson thing, I think he's got a chance to be something, right? Uh, their offensive line, like I said, has some pieces. D-line, yeah, like Joey Bosa, I'd be shocked to see if he's back by the Chargers next year. I mean, they're paying him $27 million a year to do nothing really right now. Khalil Mack, you know, another guy. He's playing really good. He's having a great year. You know, is he going to match up his age with the price tag and all that? It's going to be interesting to see where it goes. But there's certainly pieces. And then the expectations are low. And head coaches love that too because yeah. they can come in and save the day and go, look what I did. The expectations are low, and now we're in the playoffs. So every head coach likes that. The One of the first effects that I did see yeah. from the firing of Brandon Staley is yeah. that Dan Campbell, in the game there were some opportunities to go for fourth down early in the game. He didn't do it. He goes, our guy has been fired. So like, everyone now is <laughs> like, you're on notice. You're on he, notice. Was, he was changing the game, and now he's gone. So it's just like you got no protection anymore but uh yeah that's gonna be interesting. i, I like that, that dan did out. that in that game though don't oh, give them false i know you did yeah that's right <laughs> <laughs> you knew i knew one more game to go eagles at seahawks monday night football philly did clinch a playoff berth today yeah but they they still want to believe that they're in running for that number one seed with the 49ers yeah well they should they got to keep fighting here the yeah Ra but you know, ravens well. play the 49ers next week so it's not like the 49ers are got a cakewalk down the stretch here this will be interesting though Last cast of effort for the Seattle Seahawks, right? And, you know, the Eagles are making some changes as far as it sounds like what they're going to do with the defensive coaching. Mm -hmm. And Sean Desai and Matt Patricia and I, what, what, Desai is going to go up in the, the, the box and Patricia is going to be on the field. And so they're obviously realizing they got to do some tinkering on that side of the ball. I'll be interested to see what that defense looks like tomorrow night. I will. Uh, Jalen Hurts, it sounds like he's sick. So he was questionable as of Sunday afternoon. I fully expect him to play, right? But I look at this. If the Seahawks can block Philadelphia just at all a little bit in the pass game, I think they're going to find plays and they'll make plays in the pass game. I think they're going to keep it uncomfortably close tomorrow night. I'm still going to take the Eagles to win 24-21. Jalen Hurts is on his way to Seattle. John Clark is reporting. Right. Left separately from the Eagles team charter from yeah. Philly this afternoon. Okay. He's battling an illness. Yep. Doesn't want to get everyone else sick. That's right. I'm told the hope is that he will be able to play tomorrow night. He missed practice yesterday. Yeah. So that, that to me sounds like a guy that he'll be he'll be able to do it. He probably won't be 100%, you know, but he's up to speed on everything he needs to be. And, uh, yeah, he's, he's Jalen Hurts. I think he'll be ready to go. He leads that team. What if it was the fumble drills they were making him do? What if that's why he well, got sick? Well, maybe it was like, just the fact that he had to go face-to-face -face with Micah Parsons last week, who was also <laughs> sick in that game. Oh, yeah, and he didn't wear a mask. No, he didn't wear a mask. So now they both have COVID, but nobody cares about that anymore. <laughs> so we just move on. It's don't ask. Don't, it's like, <laughs> don't are you ask, sick? Don't, I, don't, I don't know uh, what it is. What? Did you COVID? test? Don't huh? test. Don't test. I just have the flu. But yeah, COVID yeah. is the flu. Yeah, I think it's just the flu. It's just allergies. It's wintertime. Don't worry about it. All right, that's it. We did it. We made it through. We made it through in about an hour and a half yep. there. Ahmed's back. He's a little cold because he became a soft <laughs> wimp from the Caribbean yeah. down there, but he's wearing his Caribbean blue Detroit colors. Uh, he's happy. Hallelujah blue. Uh, all right, everybody. I hope you enjoyed the pod. 
Sunday, week 15, in the books. We did it. I know there's one more tomorrow night, but you know where to find us. Wednesday, we'll be breaking down all the important things that happened from today. Send in questions. Uh, send in any thoughts you got, anything you want me to break down. You know, that's what they pay me to do. So make me do it, all right? It's better you than Ahmed giving me more work to do. Yeah. You know, that's what I've had enough of that crap. Subscribe, rate, review. You know where to find us. Peace out, homies. Be good tomorrow. Driving to work and listening to this. Clap it up. Clap it up. Yo, yo, what up, homies? Thanks for watching. Remember, subscribe to Chris Sims on Button. Right now, we got Sunday pod, right? So you can have it Monday morning. We recap all the action. Wednesday, it's the What the F*** Happened podcast. We're going to get deep in the weeds on the key matchups of the week. And then Thursday, I'm picking games with that jerk Florio. So you know where to find us, homies. Keep watching. Peace out. We'll see you.